Welcome back, Naglings. Today we are going to be looking at my new series, Building a Chaos Dwarf Army. But before we start, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and ring the Tallyman's bell so you don't miss an update. Building a Chaos Dwarf Army will be in the same vein as my previous Building a Realms of Chaos Army series, in that for the most part it will be predominantly miniatures and lore to assist in understanding. This will also allow me to flesh out what I can, where previously there may have been confusion. The Chaos Dwarfs have languished in limbo for decades, with little to no support and threadbare information accompanying few miniatures. It is in this direction that I wish to shed light, or should I say, darkness. Let us begin. The following was attributed to a Dwarf Scholar, and sums the Chaos Dwarfs up quite nicely, albeit from a somewhat biased viewpoint. They wish to make the world a place of smoky darkness, where hope and cheer are crimes punishable by immediate slavery and slow torture. Theirs is an endless greed that neither time nor wealth can ever abate. They committed blasphemy by turning away from the ancestor gods and practicing magic. Magic, I tell you. They are our greatest shame, and they will be dealt with in time. It is this mysterious, dark nature that I will endeavor to tap into whilst building this host. Chaos Dwarf miniatures are for the most part quite difficult to come by. As a race that has been left unsupported for so long, many of the older miniatures are pricey. This is where I plan to use as many different manufacturers' proxy models as I can to flesh out the ranks. There are several very good companies that produce some really quite nice Chaos Dwarfs, Hobgoblins and plethora of slaves and mutants that would be perfect for the army. I plan on using Citadel miniatures from the 80s and 90s for many of the specialist units, such as bazookas, mortars and the like. Then mix Citadel miniatures into other manufacturers' miniatures for a nice mix throughout the units. Hopefully a mix of sculpted styles throughout the units will look uniform once they have been painted in a strong theme and base the same. So what's the plan, I hear you ask? How does one go about deciding what to get for an army that hasn't had an army book in 20 years? Easy. My modus operandi is to simply collect what I like the look of, can field in moderately sized units, and will add to the overall aesthetic of the army. I plan on leaving no stone left unturned and tracking down what I think will make you do a double take when looking at the army en masse. What's the overall structure of the army going to be? I would like to design the army around its two main strengths, that of its sturdy Chaos Dwarf foot troops and its powerful war machines. I see the foot soldiers supported by a multitude of slaves in the form of goblins and mercenaries in the form of named orc units, such as Harboff's orc archers and Ruglud's armoured orcs. To put a number on these troops is a challenge, However, I think a solid block of 100 Chaos Dwarfs will be a decent anvil upon which their enemies could crash. The slaves and mercenaries, I think maybe 200 goblins and another 60 mutants and thugs, supported by about 40 or 50 orcs. The war machines, meanwhile, will consist of everything I can get my hands on. A real mix of cannons, pulled carts, battering rams, artillery and juggernauts. Basically everything a Chaos Dwarf Lord could ever need to reduce a fortress to rubble. With all this talk of collecting other manufacturers' miniatures and buying new stuff, is it still old hammer? Undoubtedly. Classic miniatures will be featured throughout, never fear. At its heart, old hammer is about evoking nostalgia when you look upon an army, and there will certainly be plenty of that flying around. At least, I hope so. How does this link with the Realms of Chaos Army? 
I'd like to field the Chaos Dwarfs as a major offshoot to the overarching Chaos Army. There are four main pillars made up of Chaos Warriors, Demons, Beastmen and Chaos Dwarfs. So this is really just another Building a Realms of Chaos Army series in disguise. Once complete, I think it really will be an army unlike any other, and I really hope that my documenting the building and painting of it helps any aspiring collectors and painters out there to either try something new or return to something old. After all, there is a world of possibility out there. It just takes a bit of inspiration and creativity to draw that sculpt out of the putty, make those ridges pop with an extra highlight, or finish basing that army that has been left on the shelf for a few months. How long is this series going to be? Loosely, I plan on making this series to the same length as the previous one. So 14 episodes, including this introduction, up to and including the summary and a finale Let's Watch, where I will premiere the full series all in one go and answer questions as we watch it live. To that end, I would like to end this introductory video there and open up the comments to you. Be sure to like, share, subscribe and ring the tallyman's bell so you can keep up with this huge project. Peace. Welcome back, Nerdlings. Today we are taking a look at the lore of the Chaos Dwarves, assisted by my compatriot, Voldemort. But before we start, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and ring the tallyman's bell so you don't miss an update. The Chaos Dwarves are an industrious, dark-souled and merciless warrior race of demon smiths, slavers, and brutal killers that dominate the bleak landscape of the Dark Lands. At the centre of the Dark Lands lies a region filled with innumerable blackened factories of hellforges and massive armories, a dark, heartless and nightmarish industrial empire, the likes of which surpasses all others in the old world. Long separated from their fading kin of the West, the Chaos Dwarfs have given themselves over to their Dark Master, Hashat, the Father of Darkness. They are the darkness, an evil of the dwarf race, given form. Slowly mutating even the notoriously resilient dwarf physiology, inflicting twisted terrors on their minds and souls, so that they have become a spite-filled and calculatingly cruel reflection of what they once were. Chaos has worked subtle changes on their bodies, with some growing extra arms and legs, whilst others mutated into indescribable horrors. Unlike other dwarfs, the Chaos Dwarfs are deeply learned in the sorcerous arts and have become obsessed with the control of hellish forces and the fires of the deep earth. Combining the dark lore they have gleaned with an artisanship and skill from metalwork and industry undimmed from their ancient past, they build the greatest and most infernal war machines this world will ever know, hulking cannons the size of houses and shrieking rockets that could obliterate entire villages. From their massive mile-spanning hell factories deep within the dark lands, shielded by deadly mountain ranges and set amid desolations of industrial waste and the haunts of monstrous beasts. The empire of the Chaos Dwarves has faded into legend to many in the old world, but those forced to confront their implacable, iron-clad armies and savage war engines know the truth. The day may yet come when the armies of dread march forth once more, bringing their infernal war machines to sow destruction to all four corners of the world. Picture everything that is admirable in the dwarfs. Their great skill in war, their iron resolve, their dedicated craftsmanship, and their unwavering determination to survive and achieve their goals. 
Now take all of those traits and shudder as you see them employed in the service of chaos. That is the horror of the Chaos Dwarf host. They are dwarfs, but twisted into a foul parody of the noble warriors who have gallantly stood for so long at the side of the Empire. They have embraced the dark powers, willingly delving into the secrets of foul magic and losing much of what they once were in the process. As to what they've gained, who can say? Knowledge, perhaps? But many things are best left unknown. Many thousands of years ago, the dwarf race moved northwards from its ancestral home somewhere in the Southlands. They moved along the high ridge of mountains known as the World's Edge Mountains, following the trail of mineral ores and precious gems. The dwarfs spread amongst the mountains, driven onwards by their lust for the secrets of rock and metal. Over a period of many hundreds of years, they dug shafts and excavated cavernous underground cities. They sank mines deep into the mountain roots and constructed tunnels which carried them further north. Eventually, some time in the dim and distant past, the dwarfs reached the upland region of the far north of the World's Edge Mountains, which they called Zorn Uzkil, or the Great Skull Land. Here they found a vast and inhospitable plateau, where the air was thin and cold and the rocks barren. Many turned back south to swell the growing numbers of dwarfs in the World's Edge Mountains. Others turned west into the cold lands of Norska. But some of the most adventurous turned east, along the bleak mountains of Morn. At first, these widespread dwarf kindred maintained contact with each other, but the eastern dwarves strayed far, and when the time of chaos came, the northern regions cut off forever. The dwarves of the west believed their eastern kin dead, destroyed by the tides of chaos that came from the north. They were mistaken. Chaos did not kill the hardy dwarves. Instead, it worked a dreadful change upon them. To survive the realm of chaos, the chaos dwarves turned to the evil bull god Hashut, whom they called the father of darkness. Hashut laid his blessings upon them, and for the first time, magic users arose among the dwarf race. The chaos dwarf sorcerers now rule the rest of their people with absolute authority. For they are not only powerful mages, they are also the priesthood of Hashat. They are strange and tortured beings, greatly skilled at the blending of magic into their ingenious engineering, but cursed. Dwarfs were never meant to wield the magic of chaos, and the price they pay is the curse of stone. Each chaos dwarf sorcerer will, inevitably, one day slowly transform into an immobile stone statue. The change starts with their feet, which turn grey and useless, before progressing throughout the rest of their body. Many of them use their sorcerous engineering to construct new steam-driven bodies for a time, but they too eventually succumb to the curse. Their immobile forms now line the road leading to the centre of their mighty empire, the Tower of Zarnagrund, city of fire and desolation. The tower is a terrible obsidian ziggurat that constantly throbs with the pounding of hammers and the screams of slaves being sacrificed in molten cauldrons to Hashat's greater glory. It is the labour of generations of slaves surrounded by mountainous piles of displaced rock from the mines that gouge the landscape surrounding the tower and slag from the countless forges of the Chaos Dwarves. At the apex of the tower sits a vast temple dedicated to Hashat, which is watched over by the fierce Bull Centaurs. Bull Centaurs long ago mutated from Chaos Dwarves, doubtless after Hashat had an influence on the race. They have the lower bodies of bulls and the upper bodies of heavily muscled, 
but fanged chaos dwarfs. They are fearless and terrible, reveling only in the spilling of blood and glorifying the father of darkness. The Chaos Dwarf Empire continued to grow stronger and stronger for centuries until rebellion began to foment. For centuries, the Chaos Dwarfs ruled supreme over the Dark Lands, their furnaces and workshops ceaselessly churning out infernal war machines by the dozens, each one destined to bring only woe and misery upon the wider world. Fueled by slaves, the Chaos Dwarfs were masters of their own dark, twisted world, until the day came when the slaves rose up in rebellion and nearly spelt the doom of all of their kind. During that forgotten age, the Chaos Dwarfs grew wary of the constant animosity and infighting of their greenskinned slaves, and so sought a solution to make them more obedient towards their tyrannical masters. With the aid of dark magic and the selection of the largest and strongest of their greenskinned slaves, they magically bred the first Black Orcs into existence. Their meddling in the natural world turned to catastrophe, for their ill-fated attempt to create a more disciplined and highly coordinated greenskin slave force only made them the perfect leaders for their brethren to rise up and topple their sadistic rule. The magical abilities of the dwarf sorcerers could never erase the strong sense of independence that all orcs possess. And when the Greenskins rose up in rebellion, the great uprising that followed almost led to the complete destruction of the entire empire, making it as far as the doors to the Temple of Hashat, the very dark heart of the Chaos Dwarf Empire. However, in their hour of triumph, only the timely betrayal of their hobgoblin allies spared the Chaos Dwarfs from their complete and total annihilation. The Dwarfs would have you believe that they are immune to the taint of Chaos, but it is not so. It is true that their hardy constitutions resist the effects of the warping longer than the humans, and mutants are fairly rare among them. However, those that fall go far indeed. Their mutants often have skin that seems to be made of metal or stone. A number of them have the shape of centaurs, only they have bodies that resemble stunted bulls. When I've tried to discuss this with dwarfs, their reactions have been somewhat extreme. Several times I was told my head would be parted from my shoulders if I ever brought up the subject again, which leads me to believe that there must be more to the story. It is a shame, really, that taciturn nature prevents them from employing my expertise to their advantage. Physically, Chaos Dwarfs resemble other Dwarfs, for all Dwarfs are resistant to the influence of magic, and so Chaos has not warped them to the gross degree it has some other creatures. Apart from their long tusks, they display few of the mutations that Chaos brings. Some develop bull-like features, even cloven hooves and occasionally horns. These mutations are rarely seen amongst Chaos Dwarf warriors. It is Chaos Dwarf sorcerers who are most likely to show the effects of magic. Unlike other dwarfs, the Chaos Dwarfs are extremely learned in magic. The Chaos Dwarf sorcerers are the masters of the Tower of Zark Nagrund. They are the lords of their race, directing the labours of the slaves and the conquests of the armies. The Chaos Dwarf Sorcerers are also the High Priests of Hashat, the Father of Darkness, whose burning temple sits atop the mountainous city. The iron statue of Hashat is wrought in the form of a gigantic bull, which glows red-hot with the heat of the burning furnace within its metal belly. The Chaos Dwarfs sacrifice captives to their god, by throwing them into cauldrons of molten iron or tossing them into roaring furnaces. If the influence of chaos has worked terrifying changes upon the bodies of the chaos dwarfs, this is as nothing 
compared to the transmutation of their hardy dwarf minds. The traditional dwarf values of stubborn determination, craftsmanship and industry have been twisted into a perverted mockery in the hearts of the Chaos Dwarfs. They became pitiless, macabre and cold-hearted creatures, devoid of mercy and consumed by a need to enslave and dominate everyone and everything they come into contact with. And from this need grew their empire, year upon year, decade upon decade, and then century upon century. With malevolent intent and monstrous patience, the dominion of the cursed dwarfs has slowly grown. Down the centuries their culture became as corrupted as their minds at every level, from their language and runecraft to the structure of their clans and their worship all tainted by chaos and poisoned by malice. However, they are still uniquely dwarven in many respects. Loyalty, grudge and kinship stand as solid as iron. But mercy and weakness are intolerable flaws to be contemptuously destroyed. This comes not from some kind of howling anarchy such that the human followers of chaos employ nor the unthinking savagery of the beastmen, or even the desperate labyrinthian intrigues and vicious aggression of the skaven. Instead, they are consumed with a grim, cold cruelty and calculated brutality. Where was Grimnir when the warriors were dying? Where was Valea when their children sickened? When they called out for aid in the deep places where they delved, it was not Grangni who answered the call, but mighty Hashut who delivered them in their time of need. Who are the real traitors here? The kin who abandoned them to darkness, madness and death, or those who only sought to survive against the forces of chaos? The chaos dwarves have no equivalent to a high king, nor any form of a central figurehead. Instead, the delegation and running of their dark empire is usually run by a Karda of the High Priests of Hashat. Their lore is deep and ancient, a study of machines and magic combined to produce arcane engines of power and destruction. It was Chaos Dwarf sorcerers who constructed the city in past ages, who carved its shape from obsidian and raised its dark towers fashioning its massive gateways. They are few in number, probably no more than a few hundred amongst the whole Chaos Dwarf race. In the Temple of Hashat, the Chaos Dwarf sorcerers meet in a great conclave of evil to make their plans of domination. There is no leader nor formal hierarchy amongst them, but the strongest voice belongs to the oldest and most powerful. For Chaos Dwarfs respect age and knowledge just as much as other Dwarfs. Each Chaos Dwarf Sorcerer controls part of the city, with its workshops and forges, slaves and warriors as part of his personal dominion. The truth about the Chaos Dwarfs is buried beneath lies and evasions, for they are the great shame of the Dwarfs. Ask any Dwarf and they'll fiercely deny their existence. But protestations aside, rumours of the great foundries in the Darklands, of horrid bull centaurs, of great cauldrons filled with molten metal hungrily devouring sacrifices to some blasphemous dark god, bring all too true to be the result of idle speculation. The dominion of the Chaos Dwarfs has come to encompass the fire-scorched volcanic plain of Zarduk, at the heart of which Zarnagrun sits, and, like a black iceberg, its real extent lies not above, with its armoured ziggurats and fire-lanced temples, but below the surface in countless miles of magmalit delvings, cavernous chambers and vaulted mines, which resound to the cries of tortured slaves and the ringing of hammers in an untold number of diabolic forges. 
for many miles around it the plain of Tsar has succumbed to the hand of the Chaos Dwarves. It is littered with the scars of vast open mines, fiery rivers of magma, ash dunes and stagnant pools of foaming yellow and blood red, noxious with toxic spoil and fortified workings. Watch posts line the great machine-crushed roads upon which countless slaves haul ore and plunder to feed the ever-hungry city of the Chaos Dwarfs. Beyond their heartland is the Plain of Tsar. They have raised great fortress citadels and towers to establish their dominion throughout the far-flung and perilous dark lands, although no force, even one as brutal as the Chaos Dwarfs, can lay claim to the true sovereignty over this vast realm of accursed, monster-infested, shifting ash deserts. At the edges of the dark lands, the outposts and black iron watchtowers of the Chaos Dwarfs extend as far as the great desolation of Asgore and the coastline of the Sea of Dread to the south and high pass to the north, while Makulak, the place of the skull, seat of the ancient dwarf hold before the time of Chaos, is still populated, but is a strange, secretive place, and the bustling workings of its slave port and anchorage hide an ancient inner city that is little more than a heavily garrisoned tomb. The forbidden lower levels of Uzkulak are shunned, even by its masters, and to be consigned to its depths is the strictest of punishments. You may curse them, shun them, deny their existence, but that is no matter. You have done so for centuries. Had you not abandoned them, the vast family would never have been sundered. Thanks to your cowardice, they are strong and mighty. Sing the truths that have long been hidden from dwarf eyes. The Chaos Dwarf civilization has grown apart from the influences and developments of the old world and has acquired a distinctive character of its own. Chaos Dwarfs wear armor made from metal scales bound together with flexible wire that makes a strong but pliable defense. This armor is usually painted red Many wear extremely tall helmets that are as much a symbol of status as they are for protection. Depending upon his expertise, a Chaos Dwarf's helmet can be in a distinctive shape or may be decorated in a specific way. The most important Chaos Dwarfs wear especially elaborate helmets. All Dwarfs have thick beards and Chaos Dwarfs curl their beards in exotic styles. This makes them look even more ferocious, and draws attention to their long, snaggled tusks. For many in the Dark North, the Dwarfs of the Dark Lands are good allies. They forge swords, armor, and weapons. They ask only for slaves in return. The industry of the Chaos Dwarfs is near unmatched, even by their noble kin. The Chaos Dwarfs are master craftsmen, and their armories produce an endless stream of armour and weapons, dark devices and works of demon-fueled occult engineering. Much of this war gear, the lesser products of their craft, blades and steel, whose quality still outmatches any mere human craftsmanship, is traded northwards to the warring chaos-touched tribes and eastward to the ogre kingdoms in return for slaves for which the Chaos Dwarfs have an unending demand. Rare metals and gems, and to slake whatever strange desires the Sorcerer Prophet's experiments might require. By this trade, blood is spilled across the world by their weapons, and in doing so, the Chaos Dwarfs both enrich themselves and sow destruction in Hashat's name. And, moreover, They spread their insidious influence even further, gather intelligence in regards to their enemies, and so bring their dreams of dominion closer. One drop 
of shed blood at a time. The greater works of their hell forges and the spawn of the dark intellect of their sorcerers, however, they guard jealously for themselves. And it is on the bedrock of these malevolent engines, savage weapons and brutal sorcery that the Chaos Dwarf's true power is founded. Chaos Dwarf warriors are themselves equipped to the highest standard, and every sorcerer lord arts and outfits their soldiers to their own design, and in their own distinctive livery. The majority of their troops are armed with masterfully crafted axes, vicious stabbing blades, and barbed war picks, and protected by heavy scale corslets of rune-hardened iron or bronze, tall helmets and heavy metal shields. The most potent wear so-called black shard armour, forged with hellfire and blood, stronger than mere steel and phenomenally resistant to the effects of fire and heat. A significant number of troops are armed with firearms, from intricate wheel-lock pistols to the bladed fire-glaive repeating guns. But the hail-shot blunderbuss, a powerful short-range weapon whose murderous fire is amplified when used in ranked fuselage, is the most common and iconic. This last weapon was developed to combat the near-limitless orc and goblin hordes that abound in the lands around the Chaos Dwarf's domain, and has become the terror of the Greenskins in battle. Able to mow down the orc charge and slaughter scores of howling goblins in a single, thunderous firestorm of lead. They do what they must to survive, making many concessions and throwing their lots in with the greenskins, but as their masters, not as slaves. Of course, their values would never have been compromised had it not been for the betrayal of the past. Slavery fuels the industry of Zarnagrund, even though their numbers have shown a slow but steady increase down the long centuries in which they have carved their empire from the Dark Lands. The Chaos Dwarves are still few, and are far outnumbered in their realm by those over who they claim dominion by virtue of might and cruelty. The Chaos Dwarves consider all life other than that of their own kind to have value only as raw resource and fitting sacrifice, and to them the muscle and sinew and even the souls of those that bow and scrape at a gesture of their iron-shod hands and cringe before the stroke of their steel-barbed whips are no more than a commodity to be amassed, exploited and spent. Without slaves, Zarnagrund would not have been built. Its vast industries could not be maintained, and even now the need for fresh blood and labour only increases with each passing year, and the desolate empire always hungers for more. If the Chaos Dwarf's grand and sepulchral plans bow to any pressure for speed in their execution, it is this increasing need for fresh slaves that is the cause. Should the levels of slaves falter through disaster or overuse, and are required at the commissioning of any grand new design, the Chaos Dwarf war host is gathered and a suitable target selected for despoil. While simultaneously Iron Mask emissaries go out to the tribes of dark-hearted men, ogres and even orcs to barter razored steel for lives. This, in turn, can trigger fresh assaults and ravages far beyond the Dark Lands to feed the Chaos Dwarfs' tally. And captives taken in distant lands can eventually find their end drudging in the slave pits of Zarduk, or slaughtered upon its burning altars. Unfortunate wretches of many races toil amid the poisoned air and burning ash of Zarduk, and like the craftsmen they are, the Chaos Dwarfs prefer, when possible, to select the right tool for the right job. 
from mutilated elves flayed and bled to provide alchemical ungans to fettered and broken chaos beasts from the northern wastes harnessed for their immense strength and tolerance for injury but by far the most common slaves in the chaos dwarf realm are orcs and goblins and this is not simply because they are native to the dark lands and its bordering mountains but also because they are hardy creatures who will often last the longest in the noxious fumes and murderous conditions under which they are made to labor of these the hobgoblins have a unique and favored place as much as a slave might be favored by such cruel and callous masters perhaps the most distrusted vicious and above all treacherous of goblin kind the chaos dwarfs seldom reduce the hobgoblins to base toil but rather employ them as slave overseers lackeys and even as troops providing utterly disposable reinforcements for their own forces enabling a larger enemy army to be weakened without cost in chaos dwarf lives before they themselves move in for the kill hated by the other greenskins who would happily murder them if they could the hobgoblins of the dark lands have come to rely on the chaos dwarfs for patronage and protection while they are so treacherously eager to betray each other for advancement they are quite incapable of fomenting any cohesive rebellion against their brutal masters as they cannot even trust each other making them in some way the perfect slaves humans too have their place among the slaves of the chaos dwarfs as they are adaptable and quick-witted if though less durable than greenskins and considerably more unpredictable as do ogres who are valued for their raw power but always present a danger as their primitive violent spirits can never be fully broken skaven are never taken alive unless to be worked almost immediately to death or used as paltry mass sacrifices as they are simply too devious and the chaos dwarfs have learned from bitter experience that any group taken might well conceal untold spies saboteurs and even deliberately infected plague carriers placed in their midst but of all the races to fall into the hands of the masters of Zarnagrund the darkest fate awaits their kin the dwarfs of the west the fruits of the bitter malice of long brooding millennia are reserved for the dwarfs and of all sacrifices to hushat none are more favored than those loyal to the treacherous ancestor gods that have abandoned them i'll say this and it will be the last i speak on this subject the so-called chaos dwarves are traitors they betrayed the good people and way of life of the dwarf holds in the empire they are the walking dead just waiting for the armies of grungni and the empire to extinguish them each chaos dwarf in addition to being a craftsman or artificer is also a highly trained and disciplined warrior often with scores of years of battle experience to draw upon This martial skill is matched only by their cruel desire to utterly crush anything that would dare oppose them and grind it under their heels. There are relatively few chaos dwarfs, and each and every one of them belongs to one of the chaos dwarf sorcerers, body and soul. Chaos dwarfs are an unnerving sight in battle. They are brutish, grotesque figures, plated in black or burnished armor. of heavy plate and jagged scales crowned with tall helms mounted with flame tongue spiked coronas or sharpened horns the livery is bright and bloody and the distorted faces if they are seen at all are bestial and filled with malice their presence is intended to inspire fear in their foes and they have lost none of the toughness or skilled arms of their western dwarf kin 
To them, there are few greater pleasures than the bloody sundering of a foe, be it by crushing axe blow or the flesh-shredding volley of blunderbuss fire. Alongside these warriors, Chaos Dwarf armies make extensive use of their slave force, most notably their orc, goblin and black orc slaves, which are often overseen by hobgoblin overseers. Yet the true might of the Chaos Dwarfs does not come from their rune-etched weapons or black powder rifles, but from the massive war machines that accompany each and every one of their armies. In the creation of arms and diabolical engines of destruction, the Chaos Dwarfs of Zarnagrund have no equal in the world. Well, I think that went okay. What say, Uncle Nurgling? Lovely stuff. Now, off to bed with you. Doodloo. To that end, I would like to end this video there and open up the comments to you. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and ring the tallyman's bell so you can keep up to date with this huge project. Peace. Welcome back, Nerdlings. Today we're going to be taking a look at some Chaos Dwarves. But before we start, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and ring the Tallyman's bell so you don't miss an update. Chaos Dwarves are the dark kin of the Dwarves, who have been corrupted by the influence of Chaos. They were a faction in Warhammer Fantasy Battle up until the 5th edition. Despite how awesome these guys are, they were ditched by Games Workshop because they weren't selling as much as Chaos, Orcs and Goblins or Elves to new players. For ages, they existed only as a dim, fond memory to the veterans of the hobby. They did one new model, the Hell Cannon and its attending Chaos Dwarf crew, but little else. Lo and behold, Forge World flew to the rescue, from where you can buy some brilliant Chaos Dwarf models and can find the rules to use them in Tamakan, the Throne of Chaos. The Tamakan rulebook is fairly extensive and has some powerful units so it can stand on its own, though the book itself suggests Chaos Dwarfs work best when incorporated into a Warriors of Chaos army used as part of the Chaos Great Hosts rule set provided in the book or used as allies. Common Chaos Dwarfs, surprisingly, are not the mainstay of the army in this rule set, being relegated to roles as War Machine crew, even though they have stats for a champion version, the Overseer. They're pretty much the same as Dwarves, even showing the Resolute and Relentless rules, but they have unique gear in the form of the Hail Shot Blunderbuss and a unique rule, Contempt, which means they only take panic tests as a result of the breaking or destruction of Chaos Dwarf or Ball Centaur units. This may seem unusual, but since the Chaos Dwarfs are explicitly only interested in slave taking, it makes sense that the common Chaos Dwarf fights only at the side of huge, death-spitting Doomsday Machines. Leadership, naturally, belongs to the Magi of Hashat, the Demon Smiths, heroes who use the laws of fire, death or metal and the Sorcerer Prophets, Lords who use the Laws of Fire, Death, Metal, or Hashat. Miscasts are deadly. Suffer a miscast and make a toughness check. Failure costs you a wound, though the first failed miscast gives a plus one toughness for the rest of the game. These are nasty characters with a lot of special tricks and gear, including randomised unique magical weapons, naphtha bombs and granting re-rolls to your war machines. As an aside, you may be asking who is Hashat? He is the father of darkness, the minor chaos god of fire, greed and tyranny, and a chaos dwarf's patron god, a grim and malignant being 
often represented as a great blazing bull wreathed in smoke and shadow. Hashat is a chaos god, although some scholars of the arcane would label him as an arch demon rather than a dark god, while others insist it is some other foul entity let loose upon the world during the great catastrophe. Hashat is closely associated with tyranny, greed, fire and hatred, and is a being whose gift of power comes at a terrible price. As with much of their origins, just how the dwarfs of the east came to seal their pact with Hashat remains shrouded in the dark times of the great sundering of the world by chaos. And, in truth, the chaos dwarfs themselves may only have a dim and warped understanding of how they became bound to their nightmarish god. The twisted, runic cartouches that adorn their fire temples do, however, speak of the abandonment of the dwarves by Zom Uzkil, by their ancestor gods during the Great Cataclysm, their finding of salvation and succour with their new god, and the thirst of Hashat for sacrifice and subjugation in return for his patronage. Over the centuries, in return for flesh and blood, homage and devotion, Hashat has gifted the Chaos Dwarfs with malign secrets and powerful sorcery that fuse their mastery of industry and forgecraft to create many demon-fused machineries and monstrous engines of war. Dominion over the fires of the earth, an arcane and malevolent law that has brutalised their sanity and souls. The pact between the Chaos Dwarves and their Dark God has only deepened over time and grown to the point where the tendrils of Hashat's malevolence and the Chaos Dwarves' own bitter souls have become one. At the pinnacle of the City of Fire and Desolation is the Temple of Hashat, the bull-shaped god of the Chaos Dwarves, who they call the Father of Darkness. His temple is guarded by bull centaurs, creatures mutated from Chaos Dwarves long ago. They have the body of a bull, but the torso of a Chaos Dwarf, with long tusks and exotically curled beards. Inside the temple, its guardians perform bloodthirsty rites, throwing captives into cauldrons of molten metal, to the echoing laughter of the assembled Chaos Dwarf sorcerers. On top of the temple stands the iron statue of Hashat. Its hollow, iron belly contains a furnace heated by coals, so that the statue glows red hot, and anyone who touches its surface suffers searing wounds. The god is the embodiment of the city, its deity and its master, whose power flows through the Chaos Dwarf sorcerers, and for whom thousands of slaves are sacrificed by fire and furnace. The infernal god of the Chaos Dwarf equivalent of slayers, being Chaos Dwarfs who have suffered dishonour and seek to atone for it. To do this, they forsake their names and identities, strap mask-like helmets of bronze and iron heated red-hot over their faces and fight for the glory of Hashat. Unlike Slayers, the Infernal Guard is not a death sentence, in theory, anyway. They aren't frenzied fighters like Slayers, and an Infernal Guard who wins great renown has his mask formally removed and is discharged, his old shame forgotten. They go into battle sporting black shard armour, a unique chaos dwarf devised armour that is proof against flame. They wield fire glaives, which are basically repeater rifles with axe blades, so the infernal guard can split skulls in melee as well. There are two kinds of Infernal Guard Basic, who make up Chaos Dwarf core units, and Iron Sworn, who use up special slots, but trade their fire glaives for magic hand weapons. Bull Centaurs are the fast moving, hardest hitting infantry the Chaos Dwarfs have, coming in the form of a special unit choice or the Torok, a hero character. These are the shock troops of the army and are to be used with aggression. 
Naturally, the Chaos Dwarves have a variety of dread, demon-infested war machines that fill up the special and rare slots in the army. The Magma Cannon, Death Shrieker Rocket Launcher and Iron Demon War Engine in special, with the Dread Quake Mortar and Hell Cannon in rare. If you want to check out my Chaos Dwarf War Machines then click on the link above. Several Twisted Beasts are further added to the Chaos Dwarf armies. Demonic bull things of living magma called the Kadai. Burning winged demon bulls known as Taurus. Magic eating monsters called Lamassu. And armor plated giants modified for use as living siege weapons. Finally, if all else fails, the Chaos Dwarves can pad out their ranks with expendable cannon fodder in the form of hobgoblins, fleet footed wolf riders, great mobs and even conniving Khans as hero characters. The models you can see here are a full set of Chaos Dwarves from Essex Miniatures. They were painted by my good pal Barry over at Underdog Painting. Please visit his channel in the link above and be sure to subscribe. Unfortunately some of the guys got damaged in the post and suffered some chipping, so I have prepared them with a quick lick of paint. I also added some slight variations in skin tone and hues to give them a little more variety. Once I had done the repairs, I then varnished them with quick shake gloss and based them in the same style as my pre-slaughter Chaos Warriors. To that end, I would like to end this video there and open up the comments to you. Be sure to like, share, subscribe and ring the tallyman's bell so you can keep up to date. Peace. Welcome back Nerdlings, today we are going to be looking at the War Machines of the Chaos Dwarfs. But before we start, be sure to like, share, subscribe and ring the Tallyman's bell so you don't miss an update. The Chaos Dwarfs, like their mountain dwelling cousins, make great use of machinery in battle. More than mere black powder weapons, these machines have been anointed in the blood of countless sacrifices to bind demons and other hellish beasts to them, giving them a bloodthirsty life in their own right. Their magic is steeped in occult symbolism and runecraft, quite unlike that of any other race, even their dwarf cousins of the West. For their magic is the very stuff of chaos and the dark forces that come with it. The Chaos Dwarfs long ago gave up their birthright as the sons of earth and rock, having given themselves over to their dark master, Hashat. With this blasphemy came a newfound power, however mysterious and destructive, and as such perfectly suited to their malicious intent. For the Chaos Dwarfs make the greatest weapons of war in the old world. From their hell forges they masterfully craft the most powerful of machines, binding demons into the very fabric of the metal as it is forged. This art, and it is an art, dark as it may be, is the power behind the Chaos Dwarf Empire, without which they simply could not control the hellish forces that assail their borders. The Juggernaut is one of the most feared of their creations, a mighty siege tower upon which artillery and a complete multitude of weaponry can be mounted. It is the bane of cities and towns alike. With its tall tower and tough exterior, there is little an opposing force can do but train all their cannons upon it in the hope of bringing it down. This weapon is pushed along by slaves and marshaled by powerful bull centaurs, although there have been rumour of steam-powered versions making their way as far west as the borders of the Empire itself. Truly worrying reports indeed, I think you will agree. The Tenderizer is a powerful machine built to reduce both fortifications and enemy combatants to mere mush. 
pushed by a hulking bull centaur, it is something of a bizarre sight as it trundles across the battlefield, its arms and hammers flailing up and down as the cogs and wheels turn. Cumbersome in the extreme, it is an unlikely or stupid foe that allows themselves to be charged by such a contraption. Indeed, if caught by it, it is wise to simply dive into a ditch and hope for the best, as its mad controller pushes it onwards over you. The Skullcracker is the mutated bigger brother of the Tenderizer. Instead of smashing implements, it boasts a host of slashing blades and cutting implements. Powered by an iron demon, it is the beast unlike any other in the old world. A machine designed solely for the decimation of enemy troops in the most horrific of fashions. The whirlwind is a fearsome machine with flails and blades protruding in all directions. It is the nightmare of massed infantry made real. A whirring wheel of death that no man should ever face. It is again pushed by a strong and reliable bull centaur and will make a real meal of anything that stands in its way. Not particularly suited to siege warfare, this particular weapon is much more effective in mowing down unsuspecting foot troops, either as a flank charge or chasing the fleeing foes down and slaughtering them en masse. The Iron Demon is a small, compact but powerful steam engine which can be attached to other war machines in order to make them mobile, or can be a weapon in its own right, especially when connected to a skullcracker. Often used as a battering ram, its huge iron bulk is perfect for smashing through otherwise unbreakable infantry or destroying the most durable of fortifications. However, as with many Chaos Dwarf war machines, it is the consummate cannonball magnet with any and all ordnance being trained on it from the start of a battle. The giant Chaos Battering Ram is another such massive construct that requires a significant amount of manpower to maintain and move around the battlefield. Usually dragged or pushed by a multitude of slaves who are driven hard by the slavers and the demon inhabiting the structure itself. The less said about this magnificent beast here, the better. But more information can be found at the link above. Thimbrin rose to his feet with as much dignity as he could muster. Not good enough, you precious engineers, Gildare, he grated. Well, it's no air off my chin. He paused to adjust the back of his jerkin, where the sodden cloth was sticking to his skin. And I hope your little ritual made you feel suitably important. By stone and steel, it showed the eyed-bound frightened shower of fossils you are. Yeah, frightened. You'd sooner shave than have an idea. Tradition. You keep on. Where was tradition when we first took Mithril and worked it? Where was tradition when the great arches of Zulfar were built? When nothing had ever been seen before, or since. Tradition. Bleh, he spat. It's stagnation you're building. If you really want to vanish down your own bellow holes, that's your decision. I'll make my machines without the Engineers Guild, and cave-ins take the lot of you. He woke abruptly as the snake tightened its grip on his throat. Damn that dream. He did it every time. What a life, he thought as he prized it off, for her being throttled by her own beard. He reached under his bunk, snatched up one of the small skittering things that lived there, and fed it to the snake that sprouted from his chin seemed to calm it down. Well, he said to himself, I might as well have breakfast too. From a cluster of pots he collected two handfuls of things, better left undescribed, and sat down to eat. He was about halfway through his meal when somebody entered. Of the term someone can be applied to the huge dog-faced black-armoured figure that towered over him. Come, it snarled. It is time for the bloodletting. The dwarf nodded and left his meal. The Champion of Chaos followed as he made his preparations. First, he went into a workshop, where a dozen or so dwarfs were working feverishly. All bore the mark of Chaos in some manner. Time to go, boys, he called. Take everything that's finished and everything you can finish on the march. He crossed the workroom to a line of machines which stood ready. 
Simple but effective, he said to the Chaos Warrior. As you can see, we've got two types completed. The Warwind with its big rotating blades and flails, and the Tenderizer with a bank of trip hammers and heavy maces. Simply get them going fast, and they'll carve you several nice big ragdolls in enemy ranks. I'm working on a number of other ideas, of course, but these are what I have ready at the moment. The Champion of Chaos walked around the two machines, examined the spiked blades, flails, and hammers. Great bloodletting, he murmured to himself, reverently touching the score rune of corn on his breastplate. Much blood for the blood god. Come along, said Thimperin cheerfully. Let's meet the crews. I'm rather pleased with them. Made them myself, you know, in a manner of speaking. He led the armoured figure through a series of passages into another large chamber, where two or three dozen forms lay sleeping. Thimbrin took a horn from a hook on the wall and blew a long, echoing blast. The sleepers awoke and began strapping on armour. As they moved, their forms could be seen. From the waist up, they were Chaos Dwarfs, but they had the bodies and four trotted legs of boars. Boar centaurs, Thimbrin explained. One per machine. Fast, strong, and full of fight. Ideal for the job. Just a case of finding the right combinations of mutations and sticking with them. We should be ready to march within the hour. Can I offer you some refreshment while we wait? I'm sure we can rustle up some blood from somewhere. The defending army was formed up and waiting. Elves, dwarves, and humans all knew that they must win this day or let chaos break through into the Forest of Shadows and the Middle Mountains. The ogre mercenaries were no less determined. Their plates had been filled, and their fighting reputation was at stake. Over the crest of the rise, the forces of chaos came into view, rank by rank. They were black-armoured things on warped, various-legged mounts, towering beastmen of all shapes and sizes and colours. And around them, like a rolling sea, seethed a press of other things. Chaos spawn. But all eyes were on the machines which rolled before the Chaos Pack. They advanced in single rank, the width of the Chaos Army, with their spiked two-wheeled frames, their whirling blades, and their thrashing hammers. The elven archers and dwarven crossbows loosed two volleys before falling back to their pre-arranged positions. The missiles had little effect, the bulk of them thudding harmlessly into the grotesque carved panels which shielded each machine. The machines began to gather speed. As they approached, their crews could be seen, centeroid creatures, an unnatural blend of dwarf and boar. They ran almost as fast as a charging horse, handling the machines as easily as a gardener uses a wheelbarrow. The machines ploughed sickeningly into the ogre mercenaries which held the centre, Blades and flails whirled, hammers and maces thrashed, flesh and sinew shredded, bone and iron shattered. For all their strength and courage, the ogres were decimated in a matter of seconds. The centre was now dangerously weak. With the ogres effectively destroyed, the full force of the enemy would now fall on the human contingent, and chaos could break through the centre before the flanks could move to reinforce it. The advantage now lay with chaos. The Chaos Dwarfs used the most powerful artillery in the old world, a combination of cannons, flame-spitting demons, and black powder machinery that is truly terrifying to behold. Their remit is destruction, a total annihilation of their foes, with the minimal loss of Chaos Dwarf life. For the Chaos Dwarfs are a race of few individuals, and every stout dwarf is required to maximise their domination over their vast, fire-scorched plains. This is the Chaos Dwarf's art, the art of destruction. It is the power behind the Chaos Dwarf Empire, without which they simply could not maintain their dominion. The Arse Cannon, a favourite of the prudish and squeamish, is a fever dream of engineering. A bound demon is fed cannonballs until it can hold them no longer, and the rest is best left unsaid. Nevertheless, a powerful and devastating machine of war all the same. They are often fielded alone, as a support weapon, however their true power lies in force. A battery of these strange and quite frankly disgusting cannons can lay down a significant barrage upon their foes with screaming cannonballs raining down, the only real recourse for action is to take cover and pray to Sigma for deliverance. The cannons of the Chaos Dwarfs come in a real variety, ranging from magma-spewing monsters to regal flame cannons 
and haphazard warp lightning cannons manned by slaves. They are all equally devastating, powerful, short-range cannons designed to spray the target with a combination of molten metal, fire and lightning, or whatever other ingredients its operators may come up with. When used alone, they are scary to behold, but when ranked in fuselage, they are a terrifying sight indeed. The sheer overwhelming noise of these infernal things is enough to drive a man mad. The bubble and spit of the magma cannon, to the lick of fire from the flame cannon, to the crackling energy produced by the warp lightning cannon. The Death Shrieker rocket launcher fires black powder propelled rockets containing tormented fire spirits. The rockets detonate above the enemy's heads and the spirits tear into them in a deadly firestorm. None who have witnessed such a bombardment have returned to sanity, for the spirits are sheer madness incarnate. Those who are not killed outright by these vengeful fiends and driven insane by what they have witnessed, leading to rumours and speculation that these weapons simply may not exist at all. The Dreadquake Mortar is a steam-powered mortar that launches huge, incredibly unstable ammunition, the exact nature of which is a closely guarded secret of the demon smiths who build and arm these destructive machineries. Like the powerful Earthshaker, its ammunition is capable of wreaking terrible damage upon the enemy formation. Those it does not kill outright, it blinds with the detonation of its blast, deafens with the roar of its incoming shells, or throws to the ground as it churns the very earth they stand upon. So powerful are its charges that tall tales tell of a mighty fissure that was opened by the Chaos Dwarfs during one such strike, involving multiple mortars, creating a seismic shift that caused a titanic earthquake to occur. The land was torn asunder as the ground moved and shifted under the barrage. Truly, the Chaos Dwarfs are masters of destruction. Whilst the Dreadquake and Juggernaut are huge behemoths, the Chaos Dwarfs also employ smaller, more mobile weaponry to great effect. Bazookas, Jezels, Mortars and swivel guns are manned by Chaos Dwarfs and slaves alike, whilst the more temperamental weapons, such as warp fire throwers, are crewed exclusively by slave manpower. The monstrous war machine is an orc trebuchet designed by the Chaos Dwarfs as a long-range equivalent to the Dreadquake Mortar. It boasts a huge swinging arm with a large weight attached to one end. Crewed by burly orcs, and led by a large black orc, this weapon is surprisingly accurate for an orc war machine, and as such is highly valued by the slave armies of the orcs and goblins that work for the Chaos Dwarf war host. In addition to the monstrous war machine, the orcs and goblins haul a plethora of other smaller, less powerful catapults and machines to the battlefield. If designed by the Chaos Dwarfs, they will undoubtedly be masterful creations. If they are born of orky ingenuity, however, then almost certainly less so. To that end, I would like to end this video there and open up the comments to you. Be sure to like, share, subscribe and ring the tallyman's bell so you can keep up to date. Peace. Welcome back, Nerglings. Today we are going to be looking at the giant chaos battering ram. But before we start, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and ring the tallyman's bell so you don't miss an update. My boy, there's not much in this world I haven't come across. Fortunately, I haven't seen such a mighty war machine with my own eyes. 
As a general rule, I try to stay far from the edges of the Empire. Can't be too careful these days, eh? Mind, the great chaos battering ram is one of the most fearsome machineries of chaos. A titanic fusion of war machine and demon. It is hauled to the battlefield by dozens of deformed wretches, driven on by mutated hulking slavers. Truly a terrifying sight to behold, its demonic face twisting in fury as it goads its charges ever faster to the gates of the besieged city or town. When upon its foe it barks and roars orders to its malformed crew, spitting bile and gnashing its huge fangs in anticipation for the coming feast, there are few city gates that could withstand such an onslaught, for the battering ram itself is infused with dark magic, unlike that which the world is familiar with today. It is this that is its saving grace, for not even the Chaos Dwarfs could replicate such enchantments, and for that reason there are fewer and fewer of these incredible machines left in the world today. The giant Chaos Battering Ram was released as part of a range of larger, multi-part and boxed pieces called Tony Ackland's Arcane Monstrosities. It was introduced in August 1984, although TA-4, the Orc War Machine, had been released in December 1983 as part of the Citadel Presents range. Only TA-6, the Emperor Dragon, survived to make it into the 1988 catalogue. In all, there were nine models in the release, mostly chaotic monsters, demons and war machines. Not all the pieces were sculpted by Tony Ackland. The TA-7 Chaos Battering Ram was by Chaz Elliott. With the first of these huge behemoths leaping forth in 1985. This thing is an absolute epic. It's all metal and very heavy, so it's going to take some serious engineering to get it together. When I received it, some of the pieces were bent and slightly deformed, so I've been busy bending them back into shape and ensuring they fit snugly when glued together. There was a lot of glue in some of the joints, so I've had to clean that up. For the most part, I just picked it out with a scalpel, but for the more difficult to shift stuff, I simply went over the top of it with muddling putty. A fully lead beast, it weighs in at about two pounds, whilst the instructions urge that a degree of modelling expertise will be necessary during assembly, and that a certain amount of work will be needed to ensure a satisfactory fit of parts. For this reason, we do not recommend that this model be attempted by inexperienced or very young modellers. The assembly instructions provided are intended as a guide only. Be prepared to improvise. Ominous words indeed, although not to be unexpected. After all, it is 19 parts not including the slavers and slaver. In a time when many, if not most, 28mm models were single cast, these were truly epic expert modelling kits. Being so heavy, the kits were designed in a way to include plugs and holes to fit them together and assist in the arduous process of gluing them together. The giant Chaos Battering Ram is no different. It has holes and pins designed to make life somewhat easier. However, there is the added problem of gaps between the joins. To remedy this, I use my favourite modelling putty, Milliput, a two-part putty that sets rock hard with very little shrinkage and no cracking. It is, however, difficult to get natural-looking organic shapes out of it, as it is prone to splitting when under pressure. Combining it with some chewing gum or your favourite more rubbery putty 
can lay this concern to rest. Some of the more characterful pieces include the roofing panels that you can see here. They are a mix of plain wooden panelling and blasted remains of the aforementioned. Presumably this particular war machine has already seen several titanic battles and lived to tell the tale through its scars and battle damage. Finally, we have the battering ram itself, a huge construct with the face of a mighty serpent. I plan on changing the colour of this particular chap and making him a bronze colour with some neat special effects paints to bring out some oxidation and decay in the metal. As you can see here, the giant demon on the battering ram is now more or less complete. I wanted to paint him before I glued him to the chassis to ensure I could get all the way around him with the brush. One of my favourite colours to paint is actually red, so this was fun to do. I like working up from a rusty brown colour and making the red more rich as I go. Again, to keep it simple, I wanted to paint both ends of the ram before attaching the roof pieces, as they are kind of fiddly otherwise. Here is the ram. As discussed earlier, I have painted it in a brass colour and will be varnishing and then highlighting with special effects paints. Moving on to the slaver, I have pretty much completed him and he awaits a small contingent of mutated freaks to lash. I have also started on the wheels, as, once again, they are particularly difficult to paint when already glued in place. Moving further ahead, we now have the main structure complete. Both ends are glued into place and the struts that hold the roofing tiles are now cemented in too. I've even gone ahead and started to varnish the thing to help with the overall handling of it. Hopefully now that it's taken some varnish it won't be so fiddly and I can move it about without fear of half the paint dropping off if it sees the edge of a pot of paint or what have you. As you can see the red colour really pops with the shine of the varnish however I will turn this down when I get around to spraying it with some matte varnish. This will give it a satin look and further protect this fantastic piece. I've started picking out some of the detail in the pieces with metal and rust effects to give it that used look and feel. This is, after all, a war machine from antiquity and should have seen hundreds of battles throughout its illustrious lifetime. And it will go on to many more. The Chaos Dwarf strongholds could always use more slaves after all so there is always going to be a need to smash someone's door down and take them. The battering ram is nearing completion now. The roof has been attached with a bit of a gap in the middle, which I plan on filling with a matchstick or two. The wheels are almost ready to glue into place, having painted and prepared them. The ram itself has been oxidised, and we are just about ready to build this big bastard. This is the final form of the giant Chaos Battering Ram. However, once I glued it to its base, I realised that I had made a huge mistake. After all, what discerning old hammerer would glue an ancient model like this to a bloody oval base? Absolute heresy, I have to admit. Don't worry though, I came to my senses and ripped it off the base, and it's now safely attached to a heavy-duty MDF base covered in stones and pieces of metal to ensure it doesn't fancy warping in the future. The roof is now complete and I managed to find some suitably arcane looking hinges to attach to it, even going so far as to scuff and bend one out of shape to assist in the battle damage look. On to the pathetic slaves that are going to drag and push this mighty weapon of war. I decided early on that the ram must have its own slaves to shift it around the battlefield. What Chaos Dwarf or Chaos Warrior would allow themselves to be seen lugging a battering ram around when they should be busy killing things? Anyways, the perfect group of mutated freaks came by in the form of the Eureka Miniatures Undisciplined Army, a real mix of oddballs and strange folk dressed in just about everything from suits of armour to old rags and carrying a crazy variety of weapons, 
from large keys and pieces of wood to a frying pan and a giant feather. Those Australians really do make funny miniatures. They are the perfect victims for my evil slavers to whip into a frenzy and move this great big thing. Some of them have quite small tabs on their feet, so a bit of work will have to be done to make sure they are stable on their bases. But this shouldn't prove too hard. I usually milliput all the tabs onto my bases anyways, for uniformity and a bit of added stability. To that end, I would like to end this video there and open up the comments to you. Be sure to like, share, subscribe and ring the tallyman's bell so you can keep up with this huge project. Peace. Welcome back Naglings, today we're going to be taking a look at the glorious baggage train, but before we start be sure to like, share and subscribe so you don't miss an update. Right, baggage trains, what the hell are they, I hear you cry. The baggage train, in all its glory, was introduced in the early editions of Warhammer Fantasy Battle. They provided interesting storytelling opportunities, could be used as objectives during a battle, or simply as a nice addition to your army when on display. As a technical aside, a baggage train and logistics have been used in actual armies for millennia. The Greeks, Romans and even Hannibal used them to great success as they understood that an army marches on its stomach. So baggage trains were used to ferry food, supplies and useful kit to the front lines and could return with various loot, slaves and of course injured personnel that needed treating or, alternatively, if they were too far gone to be treated, then disposed of. There seems to have been a renaissance in baggage trains somewhat recently, well, certainly within the last few years. There are various Reddit posts mentioning them and, and how to build them, as New Age of Sigmar players end up wanting to build supporting elements into their armies. Good old boys return to their old hammer collections, and stalwarts of the hobby continue to build and iterate on them in their blogs. Let's have a look at the Warhammer Fantasy Battle rulebook and see what that says about baggage trains. Probably the quintessential baggage train is from the Empire Army, a classic medieval style army that mimics many real world medieval armies in its fashion, troops and war machines. So let's have a read. Imperial armies benefit from the most well organised and useful baggage trains of any old world nation. Their wagons are so sturdy that their baggage train is sometimes known as the Wagenberg because it looks like a small fortified town when drawn upon in lager. Nobles and knights of the empire have a serious and professional attitude to warfare and bring along servants and armourers to clean and repair their equipment. Cooks and victuallers are important since imperial soldiers like a substantial meal before a battle and, of course, there are the buxom frau lines bearing refreshing steins of lager for the troops after a hard day's hacking. An imperial baggage train is represented by one wagon and five civilians per 1,000 points worth of troops. These civilians will have standard human profiles, are unarmoured and use improvised weapons. If the army includes halfling allies, the baggage train may have halfling civilians instead of human. Enlightening, I think you'll agree, but how does this slot into my Chaos Army? Well, let's have a look at what is said about a Chaos baggage train. Bringing up the rear of any Chaos horde may be seen the hideous train of camp followers. Foul beings including those mutants too far gone to be worth putting in the battle line. They accompany awesome creaking wagons of horrific form, riddled with woodworm and decay, and drawn by pathetically deformed beasts of burden. These weird wains are piled high with cages, cauldrons, and sinister inlay caskets, whilst implements of torture and insane ritual are hung about them. A continuous eerie sighing emanates from the sad shuffling and cowled figures groping behind the wagons. A chaotic baggage train is represented by one wagon and three followers 
per 1000 points in the army. These should have Chaos Cultist profiles and improvised weapons. Lovely stuff. So, for the most part, there are similarities. They include wagons, various hangers on, and are designed to support a certain amount of troops. Of course, if you don't collect either of these armies, the basic rule is the same. Let's briefly visit the other races' baggage trains and see how they differ. Bretonian nobles are inclined to bring an entourage of servants with them and enough baggage to allow them to live in the courtly manner to which they are accustomed. Inevitably, these magnificent retinues attract scruffy peasants, vagabonds and other good-for-nothings, hoping to scavenge the fields of glory for loot. A Bretonian baggage train is represented by one wagon and five camp followers per 1,000 points worth of rank and file troops in the army. Baggage followers are unarmoured and use improvised weapons. The armies of Nagaroth are burdened with the countless instruments of ritual as well as the usual supplies and non-combatants. Great cauldrons, spits, tongs, cages and all the tools of torture will be needed once they have gained possession of the fields of slaughter. The baggage attendants comprise a great multitude of the very young, the old and the infirm. Among them will be a few ancient and malicious hag witches, kindling the fires of spite and resentment. A dark elf baggage train is represented by one wagon and five elves per 1,000 points worth of troops. These will have standard dark elf profiles, are unarmoured and use improvised weapons. Dwarves are an organised and disciplined people and this is reflected in their well-ordered and provisioned baggage trains. To serve as a baggage guard is no dishonour and many young dwarfs receive their first combat experience in this capacity. In addition, a baggage train will of necessity include a mobile forge and smithy, a kiln cart for baking bread, wagons to carry the troops' possessions, and, of course, a beer wagon so that the fighting dwarfs can slake their considerable thirst. A dwarf baggage train will consist of one wagon and five dwarfs per 1,000 points in the army. Dwarfs with the baggage have standard dwarf profiles, are unarmoured, and use improvised weapons. High elves often bring with them many servants, minstrels, bards and other attendants to entertain them in their magnificent tents while on campaigns. Sea elves frequently venture far inland and need to bring provisions and trade goods with them. An elven baggage train is represented by one wagon and five non-warrior elves per 1,000 points worth of troops. These civilians will have standard elf profiles, are unarmoured and use improvised weapons. The ragtag followers that trail after an orc and goblin army are vile, destitute and quarrelsome beyond even the disgustingly low standards set by orc warriors. Heavy and multiple dugged orc womenfolk make up the majority of the baggage train, their mewling offspring, the aged whelps and assorted hangers on make up the rest. Those too infirm, old or stupid to be drafted into the army can make a good living by working the baggage. Drivers, cooks, leather workers, smiths, bunco artists and all manner of worthless scum can profit by hanging around the army. Taking advantage of the confusion they loot, pillage, burn and steal along with the rest of the army as well as sharing in the fun, torturing captives and the spoils, eating captives. An orc baggage train is represented by a single squalid wagon and five followers for every 1,000 points worth of rank and file troops in the army. Baggage followers always include at least one orc and one goblin model, plus any other models of a goblinoid race represented in the army. Baggage followers are unarmoured and use improvised weapons. In the dense jungles in which the slan live, baggage must be transported on foot. For this onerous task, the slan use bearers, frequently castrated and lobotomized human slaves. Because slan don't use wagons, their baggage contingents are larger than most armies. The baggage consists of five slan bearers and five human slaves per 1,000 points worth of troops. All members of the baggage have standard profiles for their type, are unarmored, and use improvised weapons. Wood elves rarely employ baggage trains except when campaigning far from their woodland homes. 
A wood elf baggage train is represented by one wagon and five civilians per 1,000 points in the army. The civilians have standard wood elf profiles, are unarmoured, and use improvised weapons. Okay, now the background is out of the way, let's move on to what I have done with my baggage train. As you know, I finished a fab old school looking baggage train in the first series of Barocca. However, I wanted to expand the scope of it. Bearing in mind I have far more than just 1,000 points of troops, I thought it would be appropriate to include some more wagons and some more crazies in support of them. To that end, I have repurposed my undead corpse cart as a supporting wagon, and I've also built the fantastic Chaos Dwarf baggage train from the old school miniatures Kickstarter. In the future, I aim to get maybe another one or two, depending on the styling of the jail cart being released by old school miniatures. But for now, I think they are a pretty decent addition to the army. I was also considering rebasing my Carnival of Chaos carts as they might come in handy in a, a future video or, or photo shoot. However, for now I think I'll keep them on their large oval bases. What with about 80 Chaos Dwarfs, 40 Chaos Warriors to paint and another 20 to rebase, I, I really don't want to end up buying off more than I can chew with this project. After all, it has already grown more arms and legs than I ever intended it to. With a whole cohort of beastmen and assorted monsters, the Chaos Dwarf army with green skin slaves, and branching out into a possible barbarian horde too. All of that on top of what was originally supposed to be simply a complete set of pre slaughter Chaos Warriors. My aim was to include a real hodgepodge of different creatures as advised in the rulebook. So, my evil lord recruited a Slothman, Mudman, Beastman, a Lizardman, some men-at-arms in the form of an orc and human, not to mention an ostrichman, a strange demon with no body, a goblin fanatic, and, of course, Zygor, the three-armed mutant. I don't think the group could be any more varied than that. Uh, Twelve assorted freaks, uh, including the evil lord, for the three wagons. Be sure to check out all the fab websites I sourced the pictures of models from in the description below. I hope you enjoyed the video. What did you like most about my baggage train? Be sure to comment, like and subscribe and thanks very much for watching. Peace.
Welcome back, Nerdlings. I wanted to get back into more of the collecting side of the hobby for a while now and do a bit of a deep dive into how I go about formulating a plan to build an army. As you may well know, I've been busily collecting Chaos Dwarfs for the last few months, but what led me to build such an expansive collection? What inspires me to collect these miniatures, and what's the end product supposed to look like? All this and more as I discuss how I've gone about collecting Chaos Dwarfs. But before we start, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and ring the Tallyman's bell so you don't miss an update. Right, onwards and upwards. My Chaos Dwarf army once stood as mere allies to my Chaos army, numbering only a couple of units of Chaos Dwarfs from a few different manufacturers, namely Essex Miniatures and some of Delaney King's Ewald Dwerger. I got these models simply because they suited my style, and I really wanted some Chaos Dwarfs in the army, as they're truly old school, and give a different slant on the Chaos theme. When I got them, I really wasn't planning on getting a whole load more anytime soon after. However, as I came across a few different manufacturers such as Evil Clam and started to get a bit more into Orcs and Goblins, the core of the army began to take shape. And it wasn't until Games Workshop re-released their awesome metal big hats for Blood Bowl that I even considered what I had collected as anything other than allies in various forms for my main Chaos army. When I received the Blood Bowl Big Hats from Games Workshop, I started looking for a way to incorporate them into my army. I came to the conclusion that, rather than convert them and see them as simple troops in an army, I would use each of the footmen armed with knuckle dusters as leader types for lesser races of creatures. Initially, I only had a single regiment of 20 goblins that was ready for battle, so I removed one of their number and painted one of the Chaos Dwarfs up and added him to the unit. This change of leadership really made the unit pop, and I started to think up a reason a Chaos Dwarf might turn up leading a group of slaves in the first place. In a moment of madness, I dreamt up the idea that the Chaos Dwarfs would be just as unruly as their Western counterparts when it comes to drink, and that games would undoubtedly be played. By games, I mean gambling. So to that end, I figured it wouldn't be that much of a stretch to have the losers of various games of chance have to don the dunce hat and lead one of the slave units in the next battle. Being a stickler for unique models, I've used all of the regular footmen from the Blood Bowl set, which is four unique models. This gives me four units of slaves that can be led per battle. I always liked the look of big hats, however they were never on my radar for the army until I came across some price to sell on eBay. I've never been a fan of paying a premium for plastics that were mass produced, but at a few pounds each and all being sold from the same vendor, I managed to get a sizeable unit, including some metal traps too. As I already had the ball centre from the Blood Bowl set, I decided he would make a great unit champion, so built the unit around him. I really didn't want a generic unit made up of the same plastic model, however so I bought some metal proxy hats from Admiralty Miniatures on Etsy. After clipping a bunch of hats off and cleaning the joins up best I could, I had a large unit of big hats ready to go. I waited on eBay for the Axemen command team to become available and managed to get them for a decent price too, after a time. Moving on from the big hats, I started looking at green skin models that I'd liked for a while. After all, what kind of Chaos Dwarf army leaves their slaves at home when they go to battle? With this keenly in mind, I started to formulate a greenskin wish list in my head. Without doubt, one of my favourite sets of orcs is Harboff's Orc Archers. I'd already got them painted by my good friend Littrick and had them based up as allies for my Chaos Army. I decided that they would be better suited to supporting the Chaos Dwarfs, so I added them to the army. This became a bit of a search for other named units of orcs. Rugglud's Armoured Orcs soon joined the wish list and I eventually found them for a decent price on eBay too. By adding a few different orc spearmen sculpts, I fleshed out the unit to a reasonable size of 12 to match Harboss boys. It was then that I figured I would base each of the characters that led my units in the army on hexy bases to differentiate them from the rank and file and make them stand out a little bit more. Staying on the subject of greenskins, I'd always loved the plastic greenskins from, I think it was third edition box set, so I resolved myself to get some of those too. Being pretty piddly little fellas, 
thought it might be fun and impressive to have both the bowmen and spearmen in large units. Bearing in mind goblins aren't impressive in themselves, this would be difficult without a whole lot of them, so I plugged for a, a unit of 100 each. Of course, units like these would need decent leadership to hold them together, so I got a full metal command team for each of them. To bolster the bowmen and to highlight the fact they're night goblins, I got three fanatics and a shaman to boot. The bowmen probably got the better deal, but the spearmen have got the original slaughter Grom the Paunch model as their unit champion, so I didn't feel too bad about not giving them any fancy extras. The final piece of the greenskin puzzle came in the form of some mounted troops. Now, I do have some of Clam's Sterling Chaos Dwarfs mounted on boars, and they are almost complete too, however, more specifically along the greenskin route, I wanted to include wolf riders, as I like the models and I wanted some older looking mounted orcs too. For these I ended up with some great old grenadier sculpts, also mounted on wolves. Now I was going to use my uh, Goblin King's chariot too, however I had already nabbed that for my Chaos Nurgle army, and glued a great unclean one on it, so chariots were out. Instead of chariots, I went for some great orcs in the form of uh, a Ralpath Ogre, a Merlton Samurai Great Orc, and a Citadel Chaos Marauder from Antiquity. They are a good solid trio and have been based up confusingly on 30mm square MDF bases. Their sheer size and imposing nature required slightly larger bases than normal, however after having mocked up the models on 40mm squares they simply didn't look right. Plus I'm always looking for an opportunity to use MDF bases whenever possible as I consider it quite an old style way of basing, and you know I love the nostalgia factor. To add some flesh to the bones of the slaves, I've also included a couple different manufacturers worth of mutants and oddballs, namely in the Eureka and Pendragon miniature collections. They're a real mix of weird sculpts, mostly half animal hybrid types that really look like they've been touched by chaos. In addition, I have a unit of what I like to call Darklings, otherwise known as Dark Halflings, those who followed the Chaos Dwarfs down the road to damnation. In this regard, I have a Halfling, or, or rather Darkling, Hot Pot, and a unit of 20 diminutive chaps with various weapons led by a witch, and a character in the form of a Skeksis type bird creature. Finally, with our minds on various types of slaves, I thought it would be cool to include a more independent type of goblin, so I've included some fab armoured goblins from Midland Miniatures in a unit of 20. Characters wise I'm using the various models available from Ewell Clam based on hexes as my cohort of special characters. I also managed to get one of the Marauder Skullface Chaos Dwarfs, so based him similarly, and I also have the Master of Madness, who I think may just be the Army General although I'm unsure as to whether or not I will get Astrogoth yet. If I do, he will undoubtedly be the general, as he is truly legendary. Slaves down, next we have Beastmasters. No Chaos Dwarf army will be complete without plenty of slavers, and in my mind Beastmasters certainly can be classed as slavers of a kind. I already had some different sculpts to represent Beastmasters in the army, and started going through my Chaos Army collection to try and find what I could fit into this niche. I really wanted the classic Marauder Beastmaster, who came with a load of different Chaos Hounds. He was assisted by, funnily enough, a Chaos Dwarf Handler, and a Dark Elf too. I managed to find the three of them, and got the Chaos Dwarf painted up in no time at all. I then found a few more models, such as a Black Orc Slaver, uh, a couple of human slavers, and before I knew it, I had a whole team of beastmasters and slavers to guide my beasts to battle. Once I had the slavers, I started getting the beasts and whatnot. Chaos hounds, a large converted dinosaur, some squigs, and an old brass sculpture of a lion all joined the team. I had already completed my slave king model I built from a Chaos War Shrine and Ralpatha Throne of Bone so now we had a plethora of chaps to boss around. Beastmasters aside, I have a couple of units of hobgoblins, 
I'm currently waiting on catching a mounted Hobgoblin Khan model to mount on a temple dog that I have who needs a rider. The Hobgoblins don't feature too much in the army. A single unit of 20, the dog rider when I get him, and of course the crew of my juggernaut. I didn't want to really dwell on the Hobgoblins as I wanted to concentrate on a large number of general orcs and goblins and their animosity between each other would be a nightmare to contend with. So for the most part my hobgoblins are specialist troops that probably would just let the slaves get a good beating before dipping their toes in the water so to speak. War machines wise I wanted to include just about everything I could in the army. Of course I already had the giant chaos battering ram painted from several years ago so I rebased that onto a large rectangular piece of MDF and suitably reinforced it with plaster, glue and what have you. My Chaos Dwarf Juggernaut from Macrocosm, I think it was, needed to be based so I based that up on the same size base as the battering ram and added a party of hobgoblins to crew the thing. I had the Orc Monstrous War Machine, uh, otherwise known as the Trebuchet, which was already painted up so that joined the army. I then based my Hell Cannon on a super large 100mm base. Uh, I love the Chaos Dwarf affinity with engines of war so, so I included just about every small range weapon I could as well. Uh, bazooka, mortar, swivel gun all got added. Alongside some weaponry from other races too, namely Skaven bits and bobs, so a Jezel warp fire thrower and a warp fire cannon to, to name a few. I also wanted a gun line to include all of the various heat weapons the Dwarfs and Chaos Dwarfs could muster. To this I added a magma cannon and two different editions worth of flame cannons. I think one was a, one, one was a Marauder flame cannon and then another was like a 7th, 6th or 7th edition maybe flame cannon. To support these heavy cannons I managed to find an original Chaos Dwarf Ars cannon to add to my two proxy models. Uh, and, and complete the set. I think so. I've got one from Citadel, one from Old School Miniatures, which is awesome, and then I've also got another one from another manufacturer, but I can't remember what manufacturer it is. Staying on the topic of war machines, I was browsing the uh, Scotia Grendel website and came across the awesome War Golem range of models at £13 per War Golem, and each standing taller than your standard Dreadnought. I, I just had to have them. Unfortunately, I then realised that there were six of them in the collection, so I ended up buying them all. As large resin pieces, they aren't made from the best material in the world. However, as imposing constructs, I'm sure they'll look the part when painted suitably in rust and grime. I started by gluing the first to a 50 by 100 mil base. This didn't look great, however, and emphasised the width of the model rather than sort of the chunkiness. Of it, so I brought some 80mm squares to rebase them, and this turned out much better. Their construction leads them to look a bit flat, so I wanted them to have uh, more of a square base and, and rotate their torso slightly to make them more dynamic. To add some more muscle to the troops, I, I found a reasonably priced Lamassu kicking around online, uh, snapped him up. In addition to this fab model, I found that Common Nixinus who do a huge range of Blood Bowl miniatures, actually have a wide variety of bull centaurs available at very good prices. I bought three of these to add to the army too. I've been considering getting some fire giants to add to the army, however, hmm, I've yet to find any suitable style. So that's on the, on the back burner at the moment, pun intended. For allies, I'm quite keen to utilise my corn demon army, as I think they fit in well with the look and feel of Chaos Dwarf magic. However, I don't really think that I will ever need any more than what I already have to field in the army now. I have seen a couple of Chaos Dwarf armies fielding Balrogs in their role as greater demons of a shut. So that is definitely a road I may travel down in the near or not too distant future, as I really love that aesthetic. Alongside the demon allies line of thinking, I've always considered Minotaurs to be true followers of Hashat. They are, after all, made in his form, and would surely prowl the wastelands of the Plain of Tsar. 
I've three painted already and waiting for my beastman army, which I haven't started yet, so I'll probably make use of them too. I have another seven that need to be painted. Again, some from Midland Miniatures, which I think are the best sculpted Minotaurs available, and some from Citadel as well. Of course, I still have my Chaos Dwarf baggage train, which has a whole load of fun critters attached to it, so that will be included in the army. If you ever need a non-combative model or just a character for modelling project aside from the main army, I always recommend getting yourself a baggage train. They give a real sense of old school style to an army and you can make them as characterful as you like to be. Mine is from Old School Miniatures, which is one of my favourite Chaos Dwarf manufacturers. I have a few odds and ends that don't really fit into any other area in the army. Another eight ogres that have yet to be built from Nightmare Miniatures, Citadel Battlemasters, Essex Miniatures and the like. I also have various odd character models such as dwarf wizards that I may end up using as sorcerers or cheap tricksters to annoy flanking troops or cavalry. I also have a unit of six Etin led by a Fomorian giant. However, I'm not 100% sure which army I want to field them in yet. They may end up in my Nurgle army. Uh, I guess time will tell. Now I've pretty much detailed the laydown of the whole army. What is the grand scheme or, or theme for the army? I wanted a more or less all-encompassing field to the army, so I have sent several units away to various friends who are helping me paint the lot, including miniatures from dozens of manufacturers, most of which I hope I've covered in this video already, and of course then used my painted varnishing and basing techniques to bring them all together. At a guess, I would say I'm about a third of the way through the project, with about 200 min miniatures complete so far, and another 350 or so to do. So, with a keen eye on the large number of models that still need to be painted, I thought it would be interesting to detail what the end result for this army is going to be. As some of you already know, I'm planning on writing a book dedicated to them, loosely in the style of the Realms of Chaos books from the 80s and 90s. It will have various fluff from my own world that I've been building, lots of my own illustrations and, and maybe some hired help in that regard. Finally there will be plenty of army shots, maybe dioramas and of course heavy metal style pictures to highlight the glorious models that would have made the project what it is. I'm currently unsure as to just how much of the Realms of Chaos books I'll be able to emulate due to IP concerns, so we'll be in touch with Games Workshop to ensure I don't step on any toes or tails. In the meantime, however, there are a whole load of models to build and paint, terrain to start designing, building and painting, and of course, illustrations to get drawn. As you can see, this is going to be a huge project, and I don't really anticipate it being finished any time in the near future. In fact, I doubt I will have the time to dedicate to it before I retire from my current job. That is, of course, unless some generous benefactor pops along and drops a whole heap of money on my head or I win the lottery. So, with that in mind, I think I have pretty much summed up this whole project in a single video. I hope you found this style interesting. It certainly is a departure from most of the content that I produce. Fingers crossed this will help any aspiring collectors out there with some ideas for troops, units or models in general when collecting the venerable Chaos Dwarfs. Thanks very much for watching. Be sure to comment, like, share, subscribe, ring the tallyman's bell, all that good stuff to keep up with whatever it is I'm planning on doing next. Peace. Welcome back Nerglings, today we are taking a look at the orcs I will be using in my Chaos Dwarf army. But before we start, be sure to like, share, subscribe and ring the tallyman's bell so you don't miss an update. Ok, on to the orcs. I will be using predominantly named orcs and their associated warbands in the army. 
The original mercenary orc regiments have great character and come armed with a variety of weapons, which will give me a range of tactical options when using them. For instance, an orc regiment such as Rugglud's armoured orcs, who are armed with spears, shields and heavy armour, will be a great unit to hold an objective or resist a charge, whilst Harboth's orc archers, who are armed with bows and light armour, will be better placed to pepper the enemy with arrows as they advance. In addition, I plan on using Uzgod's Black Orcs, although I've yet to find a suitable proxy for the single monopose Black Orc that makes up the unit. I may use Merlitan Orcs armed with two-handed weapons in this respect. I would also like to have a couple more units with Grimgore and Gorfang as their leaders. Hell, whilst I'm at it, I may plug for Morglon Necksnapper too, as he was a fab old-school miniature. So there is a way to go to finish the collection. With that in mind, I've gone for relatively small units of 12, including a command team, and then placed the leaders on Hexibase, separate to their units, so as to single them out as special characters of note. Whilst maybe not tactically advisable to wander around the battlefield solo, as long as they stay within earshot of their troops, they should be fine. I've always really admired collectors' orc and goblin armies. They are invariably massive and full of interesting miniatures. The more different manufacturers' models, the better. I will be using Citadel, Grenadier, Heartbreaker, Merliton, and just about any other models I can source in my army, so look forward to more arriving on my Facebook fan page shortly. Note, I've misaligned the Goblin Slaves and Orc Mercenaries videos rather than simply lumping them all together, as I view the Orcs as working in a more symbiotic relationship with the Chaos Dwarfs than potentially the fluff would allow otherwise. Of course, I'm not particularly bothered with that and I am looking forward to fielding an army which will look the best it can, rather than necessarily worrying all that much about whether Grimgore or, or Gorfang would work with the Chaos Dwarfs, etc. Anyways, in the meantime, the marvellous fellows at the Fluffenhammer podcast have provided a fab short tale about a legendary orc called Gromber. Enjoy. Today, I will tell you the story of my ancestor, the glorious Grumber. Born somewhere in the eastern mountains of the edge of the world, Grumber was an orc like the others. He lived by pillaging tribal villages like the rest of the Red Boar tribe, but one peculiarity distinguished him from the others. He was revengeful. Among the Red Boars, it was customary for all Yorks to face the chief regularly, so that the tribe was always led by the strongest. As Grumber was always too busy wanting to take revenge for the slightest slighting that was done to him, he was always brooding on a cruel revenge. He often fought. He forgot to test his strength against his leader. Some made fun of him and interpreted it as cowardice, wearing it with the nickname Grumber the Coward. Of course, he did not like that at all, and fought and kept the vicious circle going. He wanted to take revenge on those who made fun of him. He always forgot to confront the chief. His life changed when his camp was attacked at night by the Eye of Jade, an elite regiment of Chaos Dwarfs specialized in capturing slaves. As soon as he woke up, he was thrown into a cage and sent off to the Dark Lands with the rest of his tribe. It was then that the long suffering of Grumber began. Half the Red Boars perished on the journey, thirsty and hungry, but also very tired. The draft animals dead on the road. Some greenskins whipped to tow the heavy teams. 
Once arrived at the fortress for which the orcs were intended, the red boars became guinea pigs. They were dismayed to discover the Chaos Dwarf Mages specifically asked the Iron Jade to impose all of these hellish conditions on the captives during the journey, so that only the strongest would stay alive. Grumber was passed from cage to a cell, where he underwent spells and chemical treatments every day. He was not treated better than on the trip, but he felt he was getting bigger, getting more resistant, and his skin was getting darker and darker. He became one of the first black orcs. But as his strength grew, so did his spirit of revenge. By dint of undergoing experiments, all the red boars eventually died, except Grumber, kept alive by only his desire for revenge. Rewarded for his achievement, he was able to leave his prison to serve as a slave on a hellish construction site where any green skin would quickly succumb to unbreathable air and heavy loads. The food was awful, and he had to eat a soup of stale water and grey cabbage every day, the only plant that grew in the soiled expanses of the dark lands. For Gromba, this taste will ever remain that of bitterness. One day, the Iron Jade brought new orcs to traffic to the Magi, and Grumber was called back from the yards. His new goal was to watch the jails of his fellows from various other tribes. Oh, whatever tribe it was, it was a great mistake to entrust the supervision of a desperate tribe to a black orc. On that first night, he neutralized the dwarf guards, stole their keys, and released all the prisoners. Salibek, leader of the Black Wolves, immediately recognized Grumber's superiority and did not even argue when he assumed command. He even gave his providential savior the title of Grumber the Crusher. Of Grumber the Rebellion Orc. Of Grumber the Slave Lord. Of Grumber the Dwarf Crusher. Taken by surprise, the Chaos Dwarfs were overwhelmed by the power of their own creation. Going from prison to prison, freeing more and more orcs and goblins, the rebels saw devastation without name. Jade's eye had to intervene to counter the revolt, and Gluttenkark, champion of the regiment, intervened in person in front of Grumber. The fight was intense, with on one side a furious green one, eager to disembowel a torturer, and on the other, a dwarf convinced of his own superiority. Spectators said that Cord himself, drawn to hatred of Grumber, and seeing there the possibility of gaining power over the deity of the Chaos Dwarfs, intervened on the battlefield. The Black Orc was taken in a spasm of divine power and overthrew the champion, throwing him into a ravine which ended the battle. This was not the end of the problems, though, the Gears Dwarfs not having their last word, but that's another story, which I may tell you some day. To that end, I would like to end this video there and open up the comments to you. Be sure to like, share, subscribe, and ring the Tallyman's bell so you can keep up with this huge project. Peace. Welcome back, Naglins. Today, we are looking at goblins. But before we start, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and ring the Tallyman's bell so you don't miss an update.
A goblin is a monstrous creature from European folklore, first attested in stories from the Middle Ages. They are ascribed various and conflicting abilities, temperaments and appearances, depending on the story and country of origin. They are almost always small and grotesque, mischievous or outright malicious, and greedy especially for gold and jewellery. They often have magical abilities, similar to a fairy or demon. Similar creatures include duendes, gnomes, imps and kobolds. In English, the term goblin is first recorded in the 14th century and is probably from unattested Anglo-Norman. Gobelin, similar to Old French Gobelin, already attested around 1195 in Ambroise of Normandy's Guerre Saint and to medieval Latin Gobelinus in Orderic Vitalis before 1141, which was the name of a devil or demon haunting the country around Evreux, Normandy. J.R.R. Tolkien used the terms goblin and orc synonymously in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings. These works featuring goblins of almost human stature inform the depiction of goblins in later fiction and games. William Thompson writes, In The Hobbit, whose title character resembles the traditional hobgoblin, thinly disguised by name and role, Tolkien's goblins, though villains, retain a hint of earlier portrayals as scamps, with their bumbling efforts punctuated by boisterous and doggerel song, posing little threat to the story's heroes and perhaps reflecting the novel's intended young audience. Yet in notes for the novel, he acknowledges an indebtedness to MacDonald, and while his goblins may appear grotesque, filthy and wicked, preying upon travellers from underground lairs. Thompson adds that, in The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien has abandoned all pretense at depicting goblins in a comic light, instead casting them as the great evil race of Middle-earth. Goblins are portrayed as roughly half the size of adult humans as non-player characters in the tabletop role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons. They are similarly portrayed in Warhammer and The Age of Sigma, where they are a major calamity pitted against the forces of good. So, let's get into it, shall we? Goblins are the smallest and perhaps the most numerous of the greenskin race. They often live on the cast-offs of other races and frequently thrive in the shadows of their larger, brawnier cousins, the Orcs. They are, in general, a miserable, treacherous race of petty thieves and vicious cutthroats. Goblins can be found just about anywhere but are often divided up between several distinct subspecies that are more unique in their culture and physiology than the common goblin. For instance, the night goblins are famous for living exclusively within cave systems deep underground and have a strong aversion to sunlight. The forest goblins are known to dwell within the forests, hence their namesake, where their primitive lifestyle and constant worship of spiders makes them an all too common threat for men and lumber communities within the old world. The turquoise skinned noblar are a distinct offshoot of mountain or hill dwelling goblins living within the slopes and river valleys of the mountains of Morn. But perhaps the smallest and most pathetic of the goblin species are the snotlings. Creatures so dull-witted and simple in their behaviour that they serve no purpose in greenskin society other than as pets or as emergency food. The common goblin can vary greatly in size and habits, but all of them are universally small, scrawny, nimble and evil-minded. Since most orcs are too lazy or dull-witted to do anything other than fighting, Goblins are often used as the primary labour force for many greenscreen tribes. Often do menial acts and labours such as hunting, building, herding and crafting. 
While they lack the size and brute strength of the orcs, they're considerably far more cunning and intelligent by comparison. Goblins possess just enough intelligence to craft simple tools and build crude buildings, traits that are usually non-existent to most orcs within a tribe. Nevertheless, due to their weak and cowardly behaviour in a society that only respects strength and brutality, goblins naturally don't possess a powerful position within orc-dominated tribes. Their character is universally reprehensible. There is no depth of casual cruelty or random violence to which a goblin will not sink if it senses that it has the power to do so. Yet, in the presence of an orc, or even just a larger goblin, it will become suddenly servile and fawning, a slinking cur in fear of its master's whip. Most goblins are extremely weak as individuals, and so they would naturally band together in large groups or mobs as a form of protection. In some cases, goblins have been known to split off from their abusive cousins and form into their own independent goblin tribes. Usually, the most successful goblin tribes consist of either wolf riders that roam the deserts of the Badlands to the south, or night goblin tribes living within the mountains to the east. When in battle, goblins are cowards by nature and would most likely run from the enemy rather than face them in combat. Only in the most overly obvious circumstances where victory is believed a certainty will they actually take up the courage to fight. Goblins normally wear scraps of crude armour and form into their own warbands of lightly armoured infantry equipped with wooden shields, rusted swords or hunting spears. Most goblins however prefer to kill their foes at a safe distance, utilising the use of primitive bows and throwing spears to tackle larger or more powerful opponents. In large numbers and with some proper encouragement, a goblin army on the attack would almost always outnumber their opponents by nearly three to one using their overwhelming numbers as a way to smother their enemy in a lethal green tide. These fantastic little chaps were painted by my pal Littrick, who offered to assist me in my epic task of getting my army painted. And as you can see, he's used a nice high contrast colour scheme that really makes them pop. The models themselves are lead and mounted on hollow lip bases. Whilst goblins are usually based on 20mm bases, I couldn't find any hollows that size, so I had to go with the 25mm ones. I really didn't want to have models mounted on the top of the base, so that can look a, a bit naff. These miniatures are made from lead, and a good coat of varnish is absolutely essential to preserving them. Once they were painted and sent back to me, I varnished them with quickshade to give them a tough protective coat and hopefully prevent lead rot. Lead can be a fiddly material to work with, especially if you have some models with lead rot. Lead rot is where the metal of the model starts to break down. Whilst there are several reasons postulated as to why this might happen, I suspect the reason is because a less than optimal alloy was created when casting. Parts of this less than perfect mixture oxidise and create a salt-like substance on the surface of the model. Lead rot can totally destroy models if left unchecked, so it is of paramount importance that you varnish any metal models that are from the 80s. You may ask, why the 80s? Well, this is when alloys for casting were starting to be used en masse. Cheap alloys were created to ensure large quantities could be cast. Unfortunately, the alloys created have not stood the test of time. In 1997, Citadel switched to a lead-free white metal because of concerns about lead poisoning, particularly in children. This new material was much tougher to saw, drill or otherwise manipulate, and models required some serious tools and skill to successfully convert. I will be making a video about lead rot and methods of identifying, preventing and even fixing it, 
Stay tuned for that in the near future. I hope you enjoyed the video. Which nasty little goblin was your favourite and why? To that end, I would like to end this video there and open up the comments to you. Be sure to like, share, subscribe and ring the Tallyman's bell so you can keep up with this huge project. Peace. Welcome back Nerglings, today we are taking a look at the Minotaurs I will be using in my Chaos Dwarf army. But before we start be sure to like, share, subscribe and ring the Tallyman's bell so you don't miss an update. In Greek mythology the Minotaur is a mythical creature portrayed in classical times with the head and tail of a bull and the body of a man or, as described by Roman poet Ovid, a being part man and part bull. It dwelt at the centre of the labyrinth, which was an elaborate maze-like construction designed by the architect Daedalus and his son Icarus, on the command of King Minos of Crete. The Minotaur was eventually killed by the Athenian hero Theseus. As you can see, this description lends itself intimately to being part of a Chaos Dwarf army. Their worship of the bronze bull in Hashat's name would naturally allow Minotaurs a place in the army. In fact, I'm quite surprised with all the bull motifs that they didn't actually feature in the army list at all originally, and only now that I've come to think of it more closely that they really should be included. The word Minotaur derives from the ancient Greek as a compound of the name Minos and the noun bull, translated as the bull of Minos. In Crete, the Minotaur was known by the name Asterion, a name shared with Minos's foster father. Minotaur was originally a proper noun in reference to this mythical figure. The use of Minotaur as a common noun to refer to members of a generic species of bull-headed creatures developed much later, in 20th century fantasy genre fiction and in games such as D&D and Warhammer. After ascending the throne of the island of Crete, Minos competed with his brothers as ruler. Minos prayed to the sea god Poseidon to send him a snow-white bull as a sign of the god's favour. Minos was to sacrifice the bull to honour Poseidon, but owing to the bull's beauty, he decided instead to keep him. Minos believed that the god would accept a suitable sacrifice. To punish Minos, Poseidon made Minos' wife, Pasiphae, fall in love with the bull. Pasiphae had the craftsman, Daedalus, fashion a hollow wooden cow which she climbed into in order to mate with the bull. The monstrous Minotaur was the result. Pasiphae nursed the Minotaur, but as he grew in size he became ferocious. As the unnatural offspring of a woman and a beast, the Minotaur had no natural source of nourishment and thus devoured humans for sustenance. Minos, following advice from the oracle at Delphi, a Daedalus construct a gigantic labyrinth to hold the Minotaur. Its location was near Minos's palace in Knossos. The Minotaur is commonly represented in classical art with the body of a man and the head and tail of a bull. According to Sophocles' Trachini, when the river spirit Achelus seduced an area, one of the guises he assumed was a man with the head of a bull. From classical times through the Renaissance, the Minotaur appears at the centre of many depictions of the labyrinth. Ovid's Latin account of the Minotaur, which did not describe which half was bull and which half was man, was the most widely available during the Middle Ages, and several later versions show a man's head and torso on a bull's body, the reverse of the classical configuration, reminiscent of a centaur. This alternative tradition survived into the Renaissance, and still figures in some modern depictions such as Steel Savage's illustrations for Edith Hamilton's Mythology, 1942, and, of course, the Chaos Dwarf Ball Centaurs as part of the Games Workshop franchise. Androgeus, son of Minos, had been killed by the Athenians, who were jealous of the victories he had won at the Panathaic Festival. 
Others say he was killed at Marathon by the Cretan bull, his mother's former Taurine lover, who Aegis, king of Athens, had commanded him to slay. The common tradition holds that Minos waged and won a war to avenge the death of his son. Catullus, in his account of the Minotaur's birth, which refers to another version in which Athens was compelled by the cruel plague to pay penalties for the killing of Androgeus. Aegis had to avert the plague caused by his crime by sending young men at the same time as the best of unwed girls as a feast to the Minotaur. Minos required that seven Athenian youths and seven maidens drawn by lots be sent every seventh or ninth year, some accounts say every year, to be devoured by the Minotaur. When the third sacrifice approached, Theseus volunteered to slay the monster. He promised his father Aegis that he would put up a white sail on his journey back home if he was successful, but would have the crew put up black sails if he was killed. In Crete, Minos's daughter Ariadne fell madly in love with Theseus and helped him navigate the labyrinth. In most accounts, she gave him a ball of thread, allowing him to retrace his path. Theseus killed the Minotaur with the sword of Aegis and led the other Athenians back out of the labyrinth. On the way home, Theseus abandoned Ariadne on the island of Naxos and continued. He neglected, however, to put up the white sail. King Aegis, from his lookout on Cape Soyunion, saw the black-sailed ship approach and, presuming his son dead, committed suicide by throwing himself into the sea that is since named after him. This act secured the throne for Theseus. The view of the Minotaur as the antagonist of Theseus reflects the literary sources which are biased in favour of the Athenian perspectives. The Etrusians, who paired Ariadne with Dionysus, never with Theseus, offered an alternative view, never seen in Greek arts. On their red figure wine cups of the early to mid 4th century, Pasiphae tenderly cradles an infant Minotaur on her knee. The contest between Theseus and the Minotaur was frequently represented in Greek art. A Gnosian didrigium exhibits on one side the labyrinth, on the other the Minotaur, surrounded by a semicircle of small balls, probably intended for stars. One of the monster's names was Asterion. When the ruins of Minos's palace at Knossos were discovered, the labyrinth never was. The multiplicity of rooms, staircases and corridors in the palace has led some archaeologists to suggest that the palace itself was a source of the labyrinth myth, an idea that is now generally discredited. Homer, describing the shield of Achilles, remarked that Daedalus had constructed a ceremonial dancing ground for Ariadne, but does not associate this with the term labyrinth. Some modern mythologists regard the Minotaur as a solar personification, and a Minoan adaptation of the Baal Moloch of the Phoenicians. The slaying of the Minotaur by Theseus, in that case, indicates the breaking of Athenian tributary relations with Minoan Crete. According to A. B. Cook, Minos and Minotaur were different forms of the same personage, representing the sun god of the Cretans, who depicted the sun as a bull. He and J. G. Fraser both explain Pasiphae's union with the bull as a sacred ceremony, at which the queen of Knossos was wedded to a bull-formed god, just as the wife of the tyrant in Athens was wedded to Dionysus. E. Potia, who does not dispute the historical personality of Minos, in view of the story of Phalaris, considers it probable that in Crete, where a bull cult may have existed by the side of that of the Liberus, victims were tortured by being shut up in the belly of a red-hot brazen bull. The story of Talos, the Cretan man of brass, who heated himself red-hot and clasped strangers in his embrace as soon as they landed on the island, is probably of similar origin. As you can see, we are starting to draw parallels with Chaos Dwarf mythology and story. A historical explanation of the myth refers to the time when Crete was the main political and cultural potency in the Aegean Sea. As the fledgling Athens 
and probably other continental Greek cities, was under tribute to Crete. It can be assumed that such tribute included young men and women for sacrifice. This ceremony was performed by a priest disguised with a bull head or mask, thus explaining the imagery of the Minotaur. Once continental Greece was free from Crete's dominance, the myth of the Minotaur worked to distance the forming religious consciousness of the Hellene Polas from the Minoan beliefs. A scientific interpretation also exists, citing earlier descriptions of the Minotaur by Callimachus as being entirely focused on the cruel bellowing it made from its underground labyrinth and extensive tectonic activity in the region. Science journalist Matt Kaplan has theorised that the myth may well stem from geology. He points out that carbon dating of marine fossils attached to boulders that were ejected from the ocean by ancient tsunamis indicates the region was tectonically very active during the years when the Minotaur myth first appeared. Given this, he argues that the Minoans used the monster to help explain the terrifying earthquakes that were bellowing beneath their feet. Food for thought, I think you will agree. I find it fascinating that we can draw so much from ancient history into what we regard today as modern mythology. The Chaos Dwarfs have clearly benefited from this retelling and modification of our own history. What parallels have you noticed while collecting your own armies? Leave a comment below. To that end, I'd like to end this video there and open up the comments to you. Be sure to like, share, subscribe and ring the Tallyman's bell so you can keep up to date. Peace. Welcome back Nerglings, today we're taking a look at what I've left to do for my Chaos Dwarf army. But before we start, be sure to like, share, subscribe and ring the Tallyman's bell so you don't miss an update. Right, so I was hoping this list would be somewhat shorter than it has turned out to be. Partly as I was trying to stop buying stuff whilst doing the project, <laughs> impossible. And partly because I haven't painted as much as I would like, standard. But that's just how it is I guess. What I've tried to do in the following video is split the units up almost by classic army list. Firstly the characters and champions, then special units followed by regular units and finally support and war machines. I've already gone through the collecting and structure of the army but I didn't really touch on the scale of what there is left to actually do. So rather than a simple short video I thought I might cover what there is in the old lead pile. To start us off I have five characters from Evil Clan, all of which have slightly stylized armor and allegiances to each of the Chaos Gods. So they will form the chief command structure for the army. In addition to this, I will aim to find a reasonably priced Astrogoth and convert him up using some 40k parts. I have three massive and very stylish bull centaurs from Common Ixinos, which are simply gorgeous. I'll be basing them on 30 by 60 mil extra large cavalry bases and giving them some really elaborate foliage and interesting stuff to trample under their mighty cloven hooves. Of course, no Chaos Dwarf army would be complete without the Big Hats, of which I have 18, plus a Bull Centaur leader, who will be ranked in the unit in order to make the whole unit pop. You may remember an old video I did on making units pop, I will be using exactly the same method of mixing base sizes and styles of miniature then blending them together with a unified paint and basing scheme. The big hats themselves are the four metal variants, 10 plastics with metal proxy hats from Admiralty Miniatures on Etsy, plus a command team and a single blood bowl model to change it up a bit. I have another two units of Chaos Dwarfs to round out the main troops element of the army. They are made up from Ewell Clams Chaos Dwarfs and a unit of Ralpartha Europe models, which has been painted by my mate Vaza. On to the Orcs. 
We have Rugglods, Armoured Orcs, Uzgods, Gringles and Gorefangs, Black Orcs, all in units of 12, with the leaders standing solo on Hexy bases. These will be the shock troops of the Orc and Goblin Horde. Armed to the teeth with heavy armour, various weapons and serious anger issues, they will be a formidable force indeed. The Hobgoblins will be in a large unit of 20, and another smaller one of 10, unless I can find some more models of a similar style to Nightmare Miniatures, plus a Temple Dog mounted Hobgoblin Hero. Some of my most enjoyable to paint miniatures have been my various slaves and mutants. So far I've, I have painted a single unit of 20 mutants from Pendragon Miniatures, led by a Chaos Dwarf, a unit of 12 mutants from Eureka Miniatures, led by a Mutated Slaver, to push the giant Chaos Battering Ram, and a mixed unit of skirmishing troops to protect the baggage train. To assist these lads, I'll be adding a further unit of Chaos Goblin Mutants and a unit of Chaos Slaves, in the form of a plethora of different archer and crossbow models, including half-orcs, beastmen, skaven, and chaos thugs, all led by another pair of chaos dwarfs. I have a unit of 20 metal goblins from Midland Miniatures that I need to paint, plus two large units of 100 night goblin bowmen and 100 goblin spearmen. The night goblins are armed with a command group, shaman, and three fanatics, the goblins have a command group led by a classic Grom miniature. To add some more muscle, I have five more mercenary ogres to paint up and a Lamassu lone monster that will roam about eating magic. To keep everyone in check and marshal the slaves, mutants and wild animals, I have four beastmasters that I need to paint too. The war machines are a variety of interesting chaos dwarf sculpts and classic dwarfs, including a couple of Dwarf Flame Cannons, a Chaos Dwarf Magma Cannon that I'm converting with a Goblin War Machine, a Chaos Dwarf Cook plus Attending Crew and Barbecue, and finally the Treadmill of Hubris, which I'll be using as an extra large Snotling Pump Wagon. As you can see, there is plenty left for me to get on with, so I suspect there will be yet another Building a Chaos Dwarf Army series sometime in the near to not too distant future. In the meantime, however, I'll be taking a break from the Chaos Dwarfs to move house and start my new job. I will endeavour to get a Let's Watch video compiled for the series and we can watch the lot together sometime soon. To that end, I would like to end this video there and open up the comments to you. Be sure to like, share, subscribe and ring the Tallyman's bell so you can keep up to date. Peace.